Hi, and thank you very much for having me here. I never realized how hard Massachusetts was to say when you have a Portuguese accent, so I apologize for that. But my name is Vicki Noble, and I am a doctor in emergency medicine in Massachusetts, and I'm going to talk to you about a technology that I really think is going to change the way we practice medicine, not just for doctors, but for nurses, for um, people who work in the pre-hospital system, and for the whole uh, system of medicine, and that's ultrasound. However, the reason I'm here at an educational conference and not at a doctor conference is because the challenge with ultrasound is that the, the needs of the educators to teach people how to use this technology far, far outstrip the people who can teach it. And so we've had to come up with some creative solutions to make this technology available to people. And I think um, we have some good ideas, but we need help, and so that's why we're here at this conference, uh, to share some of our challenges and some of our ideas and to get ideas from other people. So this is uh, the diagnostic invention of, I think, our, our age. Um, obviously, we're not in this position anymore, but this poor gentleman, when he wanted to have uh, a doctor look and see what was going on with his physiology inside, had to get inside a tub of water, and then all these bells and whistles and electrical controls would push a sound wave through that water, bounce off organs in his intestines and in his insides, and then come back to the machine. And the strength of that returning echo would generate an image which a doctor could look at and tell the patient what was wrong. This is an incredible invention. Now, obviously, if we still had to get everyone undressed and put them in a tub of water and you know, put all this electricity through, this would not be a very good invention. But I do think it's very hard to stop a good idea. And so when smart people start thinking about why is this a good idea, they add to it, they change it, and they make it even a better idea. And we already know this happens because we've seen this in many other applications. And I'm sure everyone in the room is probably now using this machine that I put on the screen <laughs> because you're using it in different ways and in new ways that you're the person who created this, although he may have had some idea about how this could happen, couldn't envision all the ways that this was going to work. And so I think it's the same thing with the ultrasound machine. The same inventions and technology advances that have helped the cell phone and the uh, smartphone, really, become part of everyday life for most of us is what's going to happen with ultrasound. And the machines have gotten smaller, they are more compact, they are battery operated, and indeed they can even be part of your smartphone, which is the incredible advance in this technology. Now, this is a friend of mine who um, works in a, in a clinic in Rwanda, and this is the radiology department in his clinic. And you can imagine, this is not true just in Rwanda. This is also true in many places around the world. And I have to say, many places around the developed world, not just the developing world. And people don't have access to the diagnostic imaging technology that makes medicine so powerful. And so imagine if we can get these uh, small portable ultrasound machines in his hand and in his clinic, he can use this technology. It would really change the way we practice medicine. The problem is we need to teach him to use this technology. And again, there's the challenge. So there's lots of places, not just in these small clinics, but also in big hospitals, in developed countries where there's lots of people who are doing lots of advanced medical practice, and also in places where the usual medical system, say like New Orleans after Katrina, where the usual medical system is wiped out. And now you're relying on these portable diagnostic imaging technologies to help you make diagnoses. Now, some people go a little crazy with this. <laughs> and obviously, this is not what I think most people have in mind when they think about diagnostic technology. And you know, whether football players need to know right away whether their knee is injured or not you know, is probably up to them. But the potential here is huge, because I'm going to show you things right now that you may not be medical professionals, but you can learn this in a very rapid way. Here we're looking at a liver, and we can see that there's black fluid above the liver, which is in the chest, that needs to come out. The next image, you can see something bouncing around in the heart that should not be there. That is a clot, and that needs to come out. Here you can see that this heart isn't beating very well, and again, this is somebody who needs very emergent treatment. And by looking with the portable ultrasound machine, you can see that very quickly, very rapidly, and you can make decisions based on that. This is my favorite, though. I'm just going to show this to you and see if you guys can figure this out. I'll tell you this is twins. 
And one twin, even inside the mother's uterus, <laughs> one twin is beating up on the other twin. So sometimes you see things you don't want to see. And I'm sure this video is not something they want to have at their graduation party from college, but maybe at their wedding. <laughs> So the challenge is, hopefully I've convinced you that this technology is portable, it's useful, it is accessible, it's a very democratic technology, but the challenge is there are three things you have to teach someone to use this technology. You have to teach them to get the image, to use the machine, you have to teach them to interpret the image, to understand what they're looking at, and most importantly you have to teach them how to use that information when they're caring for the patient. And I can tell you, this is something that people want, and I could do nothing but all day teach ultrasound, and it wouldn't be enough. And so the number of people who want to learn this technology far, far outstrips the people who can teach it, and so we have to think of solutions. So the first solution is, of course, the internet. <laughs> and so maybe connectivity, maybe 3G networks and Wi-Fi networks, if we can only put all the people who have this machine in their hand if we can only put them in touch with the experts through the wireless system, maybe that will be enough. And this is, a, uh, I got this from Google, so I should say that, of course. <laughs> but this is a map showing where the 4G networks are that are covering the you know, majority of the planet, really. But there are huge gaps. And the problem with 4G networks or 3G networks or wireless networks, and all of us have felt this frustration, is almost always when you need it the most, your battery goes down, or your bars are only one bar. And so it's not a perfect solution, but it's somewhere to start. OK, so now we need to talk about how we're going to teach people to acquire these images. So there's a few ways to do that. You can, um, you can use teaching labs where people go into a lab. It's connected through the wireless network or through a remote connection um, through the web. And they can teach from remote areas because the probe that the person is handi handling in the lab has a gyroscope. And so the remote teacher can say to the remote user, oh no, move a little to the left, move a little to the right, move a little up. And they can see the position of the probe because of that remote connection. So this is one solution. Another solution is to not have a remote, not have a remote teacher at all, but to have someone who has a lecture or a instruction manual online and have them use that instruction manual while they're using their ultrasound. So this computer or the computer system will teach them and move them through learning how to get the image as a module or as a teaching tool. So these are some solutions. Um, I think most people feel that they are, are a start but they're not perfectly adequate. And so we need to figure out ways that we can make them better. And maybe by having this remote teacher guide you directly, that will be, um, and also help you to interpret the image, that will be an advance. So we did an experiment in our hospital where we had one very novice user getting ultrasound images, and then we transmitted them by 3G networks and Wi-Fi networks to the UK, and had a remote expert interpreter look at those images. And what we found was there was a relatively quick transfer time. It's pretty incredible if you think about it, that one person in Boston can get an image, and seconds later, people in the UK can read this image. So that's an incredible thing. However, it's probably not good enough. Now, this is, I'm, again, I know you guys aren't medical people, but these are pictures of some fluid inside the chest, inside the lung. And you can see that most of these pictures look about the same. There's some different quality in the pixels or in the strength of the image, but they're about the same. This is a little different. So this is a beating heart, and you can see that in the bottom images, the detail is a little bit better, while in the top images, the detail is a little bit lost. Now, maybe this is adequate to make some diagnoses, but it's probably not adequate to make all diagnoses, and so we need to try to think of better solutions. And then finally, this is a poor person who has gallstones. And most people could look at these images, no matter where you were, and make that diagnosis. So again, it may be the solution for some situations and some clinical scenarios, but it may not be the solution for all of them. So then you think, OK, so maybe we can transmit the images. Maybe we can have a remote user look at these images and interpret them for us, but maybe we could use remote guidance and connectivity and, and absolve the person who's getting the image the responsibility of interpreting the image. 
And most of us know that people who are doctors <laughs> tend to be very independent. And so it's very hard to imagine that doctors around the world would ask for help. <laughs> and I know that seems crazy because I'm talking to a group of educators, but I, I can just tell you that their personalities, somehow this is the way they are. <laughs> And this is my sister's family. And the, the, I get, I'm going to have you guys guess who in this picture gave me the idea of what another solution for this problem would be. And of course, the person who gives you this idea is usually the one who's the most disruptive <laughs> and the one who's the most uh, innovative. And what Peter said was he said something that one of our other speakers talked about. He said, Miss Tina knows everything. Even if she doesn't know it, all she has to do is ask her phone. And this Miss Tina is his 15-year-old babysitter. <laughs> and so what I thought was, oh, that's amazing. Of course, why not have all the decision support software inside the, ma the machine that you are using to get the images? And maybe there's a way to do that, that we could make this an easy process for the doctor. So just again, I know this is not a medical uh, lecture, but this is a picture of a lung that has no fluid in it. And you can see that there are horizontal lines that are called A-lines. Those are representative of an air-filled lung. This is a lung that is full of fluid. And what you can see is those horizontal lines are now replaced with vertical lines. And the red at the bottom is counting those vertical lines. Now, I could never do that with my naked eye. And even if I trained for many, many years, if I did it and you did it, we would get different numbers. But the computer can read that, that red on the bottom and give me a number. So imagine if we have a smartphone, and it says to the doctor who's afraid to ask for help, <laughs> it says, select a region to begin. And it tells them, look in the lungs. Then it tells them, again, look in the lungs. <laughs> then it tells them, pick a zone what we're going to look for. We're going to look for fluid in the lungs. And here are the eight places I want you to place the probe. Now the doctor knows it has, they have a map to follow where they're going to put the probe. So say they start at number one, it counts the B lines there, and it gives you a score. It can be arbitrary, but this score will have meaning over time. And then what it can do is it can sum up the scores in all of those zones and can give the doctor a number. So this is a way that a smartphone guides the person through the image acquisition period, gives them some compilation of that data, and then tells them the diagnosis. Now, this won't work for everything, but for something like this, this would be an incredibly powerful tool. The challenge is that that is probably not enough either. And anyone in here, which is most of you I know, who are educators, you can guide someone to the number or to the answer, but they still have to take that answer and apply it. And that is the absolute hardest thing to teach remotely or with a computer or with a machine. And so, you know, there's a reason why the mentoring position, and many of our other speakers have talked about this, but there's a reason why the mentoring position has been so strong in education. And that's because you can't replace the relationship that happens between a teacher and a student with a machine that is just giving you a number. It's very hard to do that. So how are we going to meet this need? We can meet the need of image acquisition. We can meet the need of image interpretation. What can we do about remote mentoring? And the reason for that is because some of these images are more challenging. And I don't expect you again to know what this is, but this is a ruptured pregnancy. Now, this is a surgical emergency. This is somebody who needs to go to the, uh, to the surgical um, unit. And if you make a mistake with this, a young woman who has a perfectly normal, healthy life in front of her, if she's treated correctly, will die. And that would be a tragedy, because this, this technology is supposed to make things better for people. But if it's misinterpreted or misapplied, we could make devastating mistakes. So again, how do you simulate that mentoring experience to get that knowledge and apply it to people so they use it in the right way? And one of the big trends now in, in medical education and in medical training is to use simulation. So to bring students into a room and give them all this information as if, as if it's a real situation, but obviously it's a mannequin or a plastic person <laughs> that's on the, on the stretcher, and they get to practice. And they get to practice using this information in a real way. The problem is, is that costs a lot of money. And so either you have to have the ability to send doctors multiple times to these classrooms to practice, or you have to have the ability to build these simulation labs in many, many places. 
However, it is a start, and they're already starting to use this in many countries where they bring people into a lab, they give them machines, or not just ultrasound, but they can give them all kinds of machines to use technology, and they get to play act or act out the scenarios where they would use that information in a real clinical scenario. This is one solution. Um, we'll see if mentoring remotely is going to be the way of, um, of using this most correctly. I don't know that we have the answer to this yet, but I think we're working on this and we've worked through the many stages of image acquiring and image interpretation, and I think we can get there. But I look forward to hearing your suggestions. So again, the idea is that this is an incredible technology. It has miniaturized, it has become cheaper, it's safe, it's repeatable. And it's something that we could really use to change the face of medicine. And so we need to think of ways to bring it to the, to the end user, to the nurse, to the doctor at the bedside. And we can do that with remote guidance, with connectivity and wireless systems. We can do that with software support, like the one example I showed you. And we can do this with simulation mentoring to use that information and to apply it in the correct way. And I hope um, we'll see this in my lifetime. So thank you very much, and happy scanning. <laughs>